Hello, and welcome to episode 152 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We're here today with Dr. Chip Davis, President and CEO of Sibley Memorial Hospital, former Vice President of Innovation and Patient Safety at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Chip is also the former owner of R.O. Davis Construction and has long been a member of the faculty at Johns Hopkins University. Chip, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Doing great, Jordan. Thanks for having me. Excellent. The first question I'd like to ask is, what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? Um, so, uh, both uh, Sibley and uh, now being a member of Johns Hopkins Medicine, I think, uh, has a very unique opportunity in the Washington area to do just that. Mm -hmm. um, Sibley has a 125-year history in the Washington area of uh, really uh, serving the public, if you will, and the public interest and the public good. Um, you, we have about 2,200 people that work here, mm -hmm. and uh, I can tell you that I truly believe that all 2,200 people come in every day wanting to do the right thing right. Uh, to serve their fellow man. Uh, now, also with the opportunity of uh, becoming a member of the family of Johns Hopkins Medicine, right. uh, Johns Hopkins certainly has a storied history of doing the same thing, and our organizations, I think, have a great fit to do that. So you have an interesting path that brought you here. You actually came to Johns Hopkins to do building management, having come from, being, from your own business as an entrepreneur. Can you speak a little bit about transitioning from construction and being self-employed to coming to one of the largest the largest private employer in the state of Maryland. Sure. Uh, well, my path to uh, owning my own business and doing construction um, was one of uh, probably uh, just survival. Uh, I uh, uh, went through school and worked my way through school. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was in uh, construction. My mom was actually a nurse. And I uh, uh, worked through college doing construction. And then afterwards, uh, as I was going to graduate school, um, in order to not be a pauper grad student, yeah. uh, I, had to, uh, I had to work. Um, what I realized probably about halfway through college is um, I could actually make more money uh, by having people work with me and work for me. So I formed a little company uh, and uh, started out painting and then doing other kinds of different construction As a student, things. you were an employer. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, that, uh, when I uh, actually went to the University of Michigan, mm -hmm. Go Blue. And uh, when I came down to Washington, I came down to Washington to be an uh, NIH research grant right out of undergraduate school. And um, I thought I was going to, you know, uh, move to the big city and uh, live uh, the high life that's on $17,500 a year, which was my salary yeah. uh, from NIH. And uh, to make a long story short, I quickly realized after a few months that that wasn't going to cut it. Uh -huh. So I started to moonlight at night doing construction for um, uh, some of the doctors and others uh, at NIH, and one thing led to another. And I just started to do that uh, by myself, mostly on the nights and weekends. Um, I then got accepted to a master's program. Right. I didn't have enough money to go to the master's program, so I... Uh, told my director at NIH that it had been great, but I needed to go do construction uh, in order to put enough money away to go to grad school. Yeah. Uh, so I did that. Uh, I, I um, went away, did my master's. I'd run out of money. <laughs> so I uh, came back to the D.C. area because I'd had this little uh, company that I'd started. And uh, I, I did that uh, for another year or two. And uh, got enough money to go back to get my PhD, and, and I ran that company while I was uh, uh, getting my doctoral degree. So kind um, of intellectual construction with physical construction simultaneously, the student and entrepreneur. Well, I hope there was some intellectual construction. <laughs> that, uh, so you had this uh, original health interest in health going to the National I, Institute of Health. I did. So my mom was a nurse. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had open heart surgery when I was uh, nine years old. Oh. Uh, so I had spent a lot of time in hospitals, um, either uh, with my mom. She was also 
uh, a professor in the School of Nursing, so I kind of grew up on um, college campuses and uh, uh, going to hospitals, so I was comfortable in a hospital setting. Um, but uh, when I got done, uh, or as I was finishing my uh, doctoral program, mm -hmm. um, I had an opportunity to uh, take a role at Johns Hopkins um, with uh, a vice president who had just finished their brand new 450,000 square foot outpatient center, but the, it wasn't physically done yet. The couple of floors still had to be finished out. So uh, he hired me not because I was a newly minted uh, PhD, but because uh, I had uh, knew something about construction. Huh. Uh, so uh, it was a, an opportunity to kind of get in on the uh, inside of uh, administration, and uh, I had always enjoyed um, the kind of. Uh, entrepreneurial and management aspects of things. So, Although it sounds like you've been attracted to healthcare and you've been the reluctant entrepreneur, the reluctant construction man, you've had to fall back on that in order to make ends meet. Um, well, I really enjoyed construction. You know, construction's a great thing in terms of it's very creative. Yeah. Um, I think there's some similarities to healthcare in terms of your, um, you, you know, when you work on someone's home, that's something that's very important to them, right? right? very similar to one's health, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one's health is very, very important to them. So I think that um, when you're working with patients or when you're working with customers, if you will, having a service orientation and understanding what their needs and desires are and trying to meet those, right. um, it, there's some similarities there, I would say. So a big hallmark of your leadership at the, uh, Johns Hopkins Medicine, and particularly at, at Sibley Hospital, is your ability to integrate um, best practices from different industries around the economy um, and bring it into the hospital. Particularly with regards to patient safety and quality of care, you've brought in Lean Sigma and Six Sigma from the automobile industry, um, and you've also brought in checklists from the airline industry. Can you speak a little bit about how what you've been doing with patient safety and quality of care that has uh, benefited patient outcomes due to the processes that you've drawn upon from throughout society. Sure. Um, so it was probably about 15 years ago, uh, maybe a little bit more, that um, I started to have the opportunity to get exposed uh, to other uh, high reliability industries, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons that I started to look outside of healthcare mm -hmm. uh, at those was to try and understand uh, the commonality of those industries and if there were any application uh, to um, hospitals, health, etc. Um, and and w one of the reasons I started to do that was. Um, because uh, as I was trained as a research scientist right. um, and tend to look at things uh, from that lens. Uh, but it appeared to me, mm -hmm. um, having been in healthcare uh, as a kind of a young, uh, wet behind the ears administrator at the time, that uh, there were many opportunities uh, to eliminate waste and variability in the way in which we deliver healthcare. Now, this was uh, a problem that you identified, or were there CEOs of the hospitals who are saying patient safety is out of control? We're having too many. I, I think this was even before the patient safety movement. Right. So you uh, in found healthcare this. in terms? No, no, no. I wouldn't say I found it. I think that there were. A, I, I had the opportunity to get exposed to, uh, with some uh, senior leaders across the country early on mm -hmm. who were looking outside of healthcare at other industries. Um, that concept, however, made a lot of sense to me. So I, um, so an example, I told you I grew up in Michigan yeah. and uh, had friends in the auto industry. And I knew that the auto industry, uh, especially at that particular time, was undergoing significant strife. Hmm. Uh, one of the things the auto industry did uh, was actually uh, adopt, if you will, uh, the concept of lean manufacturing. And what um, is that for our listeners uh, who don't know? Lean manufacturing is something that looks at uh, trying to eliminate waste mm -hmm. from the perspective of the customer. So what ultimately 
um, do uh, you value? So an example I would give you here at Sibley is that uh, when our leadership of our emergency department designed our new emergency department here, um, one of the things that they did is they spent a lot of time with patients asking them what their expectations were, a lot of time with nurses and physicians, etc., trying to understand what the best design might be. Um, they originally had designed the emergency department uh, with a large waiting area. Um, but uh, after the director uh, and some of her leaders in the emergency department went through our lean training, mm -hmm. uh, she realized that ultimately what the patients really wanted was to be able to come in and directly see a provider. Right. So they actually designed the waiting room out of the patient care experience and they redesigned actually the flow of the care within the emergency department. And you're talking about the um, physical design of the ER? I'm talking about the physical design of the ER. Right? Which is, so we have a waiting area, if you will, for the family, mm -hmm. uh, but the concept of the patient is you come directly in or immediately uh, seen uh, by uh, our providers. And what has been the patient reaction to that new facility? I think the patient uh, reaction has been great. We're actually, I believe, in the, the 97th percentile nationally of patient satisfaction oh, wow. uh, with that. But the concept, again, was uh, from a patient's perspective, what is it that a patient wants? So I would ask you, right, if, if you're coming into the emergency department, um, you know, why are you coming there? Right. You want to get in, get right. out, get your pain taken care of. That's right. You don't want to wait, you know, 60 minutes or 30 minutes or two hours, if at all possible, to get in. Now, obviously, you know, it is an emergency department and there can be things uh, that are more acute right. uh, than your particular uh, malady. But again, uh, that's the concept. So you've been working to, and then, so you, and then of course, so Lean Sigma is something that was practiced by Toyota, which was a competitor of uh, the American auto industry in Michigan. That's correct. And so they learn from their competitors. You learn from your kind so, of exposure. So actually, the yeah, the um, <laughs> the reason that I actually first got exposed to uh, the lean manufacturing uh, was because I was at a, a, a meeting of, of some folks who were trying to look again outside of healthcare, um, they had a couple guys from General Motors come in uh, and give a little hour talk. It was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and afterwards, I connected with them because we figured out that we were all from Michigan, et cetera, started to talk to them. And uh, there was an opportunity to work with them. Interesting. Uh, so we learned from that. Um, we also uh, started to uh, study the airline industry mm -hmm. um, and the applications of the airline industry with the pre-flight checklist and post-flight checklist, if you will, uh, applications of those things in the operating room and the way that catheters are inserted, etc. So it's standardization, if you will, of processes. Um, and, and then the last kind of component of things that we focused on was also um, uh, design theory, uh, particularly that came out of the Stanford School of Design, um, which is a way to idealize, if you will, uh, processes. Um, and the combination of the different methodologies, if you will, yeah. um, uh, are something here at Sibley that we've then been trying to wrap around the patient experience uh, itself. So one thing that came out of your uh, lessons learned from the airline industry with the checklist is a five-step checklist for um, inserting catheters, as you said, and it has a corhexidin, which is a type of soap, and that every time you're wearing an apron and stuff, and, and the real application of those lessons um, that demonstrated that they were efficacious in the healthcare industry and that these lessons were translatable to the healthcare industry was a Michigan Keystone project. Now, did you have involvement in that project, and was was your you know background from Michigan a determining factor in any sense for where it should actually be initially played out? Yeah. So I wasn't actually involved in that process, although my colleague Peter Pronovost uh, was, and it had been some early work that had been done uh, at Johns Hopkins that then Peter had an opportunity to work with the uh, Michigan Hospital Association uh, on that, uh, which was really the first uh, larger scale application of that. There had been colleagues across the country that were uh, absolutely focused on uh, 
this use of this checklist. And I, I think that Peter then took that from the experience of Michigan Hospital Association, which was truly astounding in terms of its application. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, there was a collective effort across the country. Hopkins was certainly involved, and our center was involved, um, at trying to um, really get that uh, into all hospitals. And, and if you look at the application of that, mm-hmm. it's just had uh, astounding, astounding results. So uh, I'd like to ask you to elaborate on that because the idea of patient safety and quality of care is maybe perhaps somewhat nebulous for some of our listeners. Sure. You know, you think, well, patient safety, if I go to a hospital, then, then surely that's probably the safest place for me as opposed to being at home and not getting any care at all. Of course, in reality, you could get care at home and you could, uh, there, are, there are iatrogenic uh, diseases mm-hmm. that you can get in a hospital, which means uh, diseases brought to you by the provider. Can you speak for a moment about uh, perhaps the Teera's Human Report from Institute of sure. Medicine? Just why is patient safety important? Why is quality of care important? And why is making this these pro- this progress in those fields? Why is that helpful to a hospital? Sure. Um, well, a couple of things. So I think that if you were to actually come into a hospital um, and just sit and watch mm-hmm. uh, the care that's provided. Uh, First of all, I I think that uh, people frequently um, uh, see the humanity in that, but they also see the complexity of it. It's tremendously complex. You have literally thousands of working parts and people interacting ultimately to deliver that care to that patient. Um, So what we know about healthcare today in the in the U.S. um, is that, uh, and and again, regardless of what uh, political uh, party you may be affiliated with, is that uh, today um, we spend significantly more on healthcare than any other industrialized country in the world. Mm -hmm. Depending on what healthcare economist you want to believe, but significantly more. And if we pay the most, then we must get the best care, huh? Well, so that's a great question. Actually, if you take a look at uh, most of the research on this, uh, we tend to be uh, toward the bottom of the industrialized uh, countries. By Slovakia, 37th in the world. uh, I don't remember exactly where Slovakia is on it, (laughs) uh, but uh, indeed uh, we uh, do, uh, uh, do not demonstrate um, always that uh, we have the highest levels of care. There's opportunities for improvement significantly. Then, so the Institute of Medicine report that you referenced mm-hmm. uh, came out uh, some time ago. And uh, what that report basically said mm-hmm. w- was that uh, over 100,000 patients a year um, are die mm-hmm. uh, in this country as a result of errors, quote, uh, within the healthcare system. And those errors uh, can be um, preventable Mm -hmm. uh, because many, many of them, over about 80 percent, are uh, at the time were attributed to miscommunication between providers. Um, And I can tell you, having worked in healthcare for many years, uh, that no one wants to harm a patient. Um, these events, um, uh, while uh, many of them are preventable, are tragic. Um, and uh, there, as a result of that uh, and some other advocates within the healthcare industry, um, there was a huge movement uh, about uh, 15, 10, 15 years ago uh, across uh, all of our hospitals mm-hmm. uh, to increase the patient safety, if you will, to minimize those events. Mm-hmm. Um, and the concept uh, was, uh, how could we do that? The questions that were being asked is, how could we do that? Um, so uh, there, within this movement, uh, one of the things we started to do was look outside of healthcare sure. at other industries Um, nuclear power, aviation, auto manufacturing, uh, that had to make a move uh, to high reliability. Now, some of those industries had to make a move because of nuclear power, obviously safety issues, uh, the auto industry competitiveness issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started to apply many of those principles. So the project that you talked about in Michigan, that's a direct application uh, from crew resource management, which is a concept from aviation, Mm -hmm. of uh, having a standardized checklist uh, that you follow. 
So some of our listeners may be thinking, well, if we're spending so much money on healthcare, yet have poor quality, and we're having all these different negative outcomes in healthcare, and there's so many different problems, well, then why do sheiks come here? Why was, you know, the whole storming of the American embassy in, in Tehran was because the, the Iranian Shah came here for health care. A lot of people think America has the best health care in the world. How do you address that challenge um, to somebody who says, you know, why, why are we the beacon of, of the most wealthy and powerful? Why would they come here? And I think the difference is acute care versus chronic conditions and population health, but maybe you can want some insight. Well, I would not want your listeners to think that the United States does not have high quality of care. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, uh, clearly uh, there are uh, phenomenal organizations that deliver high quality care. At the same time, we know that that is not distributed equally across our population. Mm -hmm. We know that there is significant variability of uh, costs, mm -hmm. uh, significant variability of charges, uh, depending on the regions of the country. If you look at some of the evidence from the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Atlas, etc., it shows that variability. So what I would say is I think there's significant opportunity for improvement, however. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll give you an example. The, uh, I recently had the opportunity to travel with the mayor of D.C. to Cuba. Uh, and we went uh, to a, a small clinic uh, in Havana, of which there's many uh, within Havana. That's one of their public health measures. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Ministry of Health uh, was there. And they were very proud uh, to share with us uh, that their infant mortality mm -hmm. um, uh, was now lower than the United States, according to their statistics. And, um, and they showed us the trend over a period of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was fascinating because how they did that mm -hmm. uh, was uh, every um, uh, pregnant woman mm -hmm. gets 12 to 14 prenatal visits. And if mom does not show up mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, mm -hmm. uh, they reach out uh, to her mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that she comes in. Now that is not an expensive necessarily mm -hmm. uh, proposition. Uh, it, it is a best practice model. Uh, but again, uh, we know that that does not happen uh, across all of our populations in the U.S. So I, I think that um, the other thing that we're now starting to see is with the advent of technology, mm -hmm. with the application of, uh, I think, some of these um, uh, performance improvement tools, if you will, within uh, hospitals and organizations, um, you are starting to now see care uh, move uh, from acute hospital settings mm -hmm. into outpatient, or as you said earlier, into homes. Um, and I, and that's a that's a good thing uh, from the standpoint of if indeed uh, patients uh, can recover uh, more quickly, don't need to be in a hospital. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is safer for them because hospitals can have bad bugs, mm -hmm. uh, if you will. Uh, even though we do we have. Uh, put a tremendous amount of effort uh, into infection control, yeah. uh, those things can, can happen. And I think you're going to see the industry uh, move uh, to away from uh, higher cost care uh, into uh, uh, lower cost settings, if possible or if applicable. Good example of that uh, that's happening uh, here at Sibley today mm -hmm. is we have a certain cohort of patients who now have same-day hip replacement surgery. So you come in in the morning, yeah. and you go out uh, in the afternoon uh, with a new hip uh, walking out uh, and recovering in your own home. That's very different uh, than just a few years ago where that would be a two-week stay uh, within uh, the hospital. I can tell you're very proud of that accomplishment. And uh, as we approach the end of this podcast, I'd like to ask you a final question, which is essentially to to reflect on your accomplishments within the context of, of your interesting career. Now, many individuals listening to this podcast 
are participants in a changing economy. Unlike uh, decades ago where you would enter the workforce and have one career trajectory, now many individuals shift and, and you have many different people making multiple shifts in their careers throughout their lifetime and then many individuals are bringing different lessons and different perspectives from each industry into the next experience that they have. I'd like to ask you to reflect for a moment on your varied career, on the experience that you've had in construction, and what you brought into medicine, and why all of that, why the end goal of improving the world and, and advancing the public interest is something that has been important to you, and what at the end of the day you hope your legacy will be uh, in healthcare and in the world through your efforts to advance patient safety, quality care, and, and by being a leader of a uh, healthcare facility. Um, I I think that um, you know we all follow our own path, and uh, my path uh, was to um, have a blend, if you will, of some of my uh, different life experiences. It was important to me, uh, in particular, because I think that uh, you know I told you my mom was a nurse, and uh, I had open heart surgery as a kid. I had a lot of exposure to um, uh, hospitals and healthcare, and had an interest uh, in that area. Um, <clears throat> but um, I think that the commonality amongst my experience and probably many of my colleagues as well is the need to adapt and change. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, certainly healthcare uh, is undergoing a revolution, uh, if you will, uh, in not only the way in which uh, care is delivered, mm -hmm. but the expectations of our patients. Um, uh, what we know now we can do to improve uh, safety uh, and quality. So I hope in some small way um, I've contributed uh, to that. Uh, my fundamental belief is that um, as a leader, uh, my job is to knock the barriers down uh, for all the folks who uh, deliver uh, care uh, and how can I help them uh, deliver better uh, high quality care um, in an environment uh, which is supportive of them and supportive uh, of our patients. And that has been Dr. Chip Davis, the President and CEO of Sibley Memorial Hospital, the former Vice President of, the, of Innovation and Patient Safety at Johns Hopkins Medicine, the former owner of R.O. Davis Construction, and a member of the faculty at Johns Hopkins University, who speaks about putting patients first. He has taken uh, examples from other industries, high reliability industries around the nation, and by standardizing processes and by uh, applying the scientific method to uh, the problem of, uh, of posed by patient safety and quality of care, CHIP has addressed um, multiple needs. Uh, he has put the patients first and then he has done so within the context of a national economic transformation that has uh, seen healthcare become a business, and what has been good for business is what's good for patients. By putting patients first and making sure they have a great experience and that they have better health outcomes, um, at the end of the day, Chip sees that as his greatest uh, legacy, of, uh, a means of advancing the public interest. So, Chip, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Jordan, for the opportunity. And this has been episode 152 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. I'd like to remind you to subscribe at publicinterestpodcast.com, listen on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Blueberry, Player FM, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And should you wish to communicate with Chip, you can call 240-630-0380 and leave a voicemail that will be emailed to him. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.